No one lives. Not through that. Raka the Unthinkable Apocalypse. Independently made projects sometimes cause a buzz for all the right reasons. For instance, when you hear promising filmmakers like Neil Blomkamp trying out experimental ventures with his Vancouver-based Oats studio, you are bound to be excited. We have grown to love his works and admire his expertise, especially when it comes to dystopian film pieces like District 9 and Elysium. Raka is the first Oats studio experiment, and from the time it released a few shorts from it, we were drawn into the project. Please, tell me what futures you see. Oat Studio in itself was an exciting prospect because of what it offers. It aspires to be a platform for unique short features through YouTube and Stream. And if the response is overwhelming, they are game for expanding it into a full-length film. In fact, there is already a complete horror flick called Demonic that premiered at Berlinale. Such a community-focused film project always gets our interest. And when we watched Raka, we were simply awed by the capabilities of the studio. In this video, we will take you through this remarkable short film that will shake your thoughts on the conventional apocalyptic dramas that you've seen so far. Before we go into our list, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click from you, but it means a lot to us. Thank you. Let's begin. An amazing power. A gift. Raka, an intriguing story of alien invasion and politics. Part 1. World. The film opens in Texas in the year 2020. A dejected and distraught female voice narrates the ordeals that humanity has had to endure in the recent past. It turns out that humanity has been reduced to pests after an alien invasion proved to be too powerful for Earth's defences. We get the first snaps of the alien being called Clum a lizard-like reptile that dominates mankind in every way. They not only want to exterminate human life, but also want to destroy every trace of our history and culture. A shocking sight of the Eiffel Tower is seen where it's been covered in human skin and flesh. The surviving humans have been trapped in facilities where they serve as no more than a tool for alien reproduction. Humans becoming some kind of surrogate incubators for the alien young. We witness a shocking demonstration of the powers of the aliens where they effortlessly destroy buildings and monuments. A black cloud-like ring seems to be their weapon of choice, turning architecture to dust. The killing of humans was done in multiple waves, and with time, all that remained was a feeble resistance force. There is something about the behaviour of these aliens that tell you that they don't want Earth to remain the way that it is. Their structures spew methane and cause a massive rise in temperatures that put most of the cities underwater. They even burn down the forests, making the air hostile for humans to survive. It seems to be their own kind of atmosphere where they thrive in extreme conditions. To make matters worse, the aliens can literally hack into our minds with some kind of telepathy. They take control of the cerebrum and the limbic system, leaving the host paralysed and a slave to their wishes. But then, we are a fighting species, aren't we? The few that remain are trying to put up a struggle in their own little ways. For instance, they have developed a brain barrier that protects them against the mind-controlling abilities of these aliens. Unfortunately, these devices are not plentiful, and it's not possible to provide everybody with the same. But the rebellion is doomed, because it seems only a matter of time before the entire planet falls. The survivors live in underground networks and isolated hidings. They barely have enough to eat, and the ammunitions to fight back are even more limited. But hope seems to be the greatest strength of the human species, and no matter how desolate their condition, they still aim to overcome the odds. The rational thoughts make it clear that it's all over, but some primitive urge to survive keeps them going. The next scene is a rude shock to our hopes, as we see an alien entity performing some grotesque surgery on a human, slicing open the head. It turns out they're implementing some kind of mind control mechanism in the head of a political leader. Come with us. Do not be He's being paraded by two alien guards and he invites everyone to put down their weapons and join the aliens and not to be afraid of them. Of course, he is simply a tool in the alien hands and our heroes, the resistance group, knows all about it. They are lying low, waiting to ambush the group for one small victory amidst all the losses. A woman walks out, making it look like she's willing to take the offer. 
However, a nearby man successfully sets off hidden explosives on her that kill them all. A small victory is celebrated by a kid, who clearly has way too much repressed anger against the hostile alien race. We are quickly reminded of the might of the aliens as they decimate a convoy of vehicles in seconds. A survivor in the explosion tries to shoot himself before being captured, but has a strange vision. He watches an angelic figure in the clouds that the narrator terms biblical salvation. Is it the key to emerge from the crisis? Part 2. Amir and Nosh this segment starts off on a philosophical note, pointing out the drastic differences between the old world and the apocalyptic version. Nosh, the man we saw triggering the explosive and ambushing the aliens earlier, is a pyromaniac and a bomb maker. He would have been jailed in the old world, but here he is an important member of the resistance group. His expertise with incendiaries comes in handy, and he is a prized resource even after his crude manners. We learn about his incredible skills where he can create just about anything with his scavenged junk. Nosh knows very well that the resistance group needs him badly, and he acts accordingly, with a hint of hierarchy in his attitude. Two people from the resistance, a man and a woman, come to deal with him. The man says that there is news that Nosh has been creating something special, but Nosh dismisses him immediately, saying that it's not for sale. It's not for sale. Nosh exclaims how he's happy that the aliens invaded, because life for him is exactly how he wanted it to be. He enjoys the lawlessness and the status he has in society. He asks for some bait in the form of some of the six survivors, who are not needed for the cause any longer. The man is furious, but the woman realises that Nosh has the leverage in this deal and chooses to comply. She accepts an offer that would have been ridiculous in peacetime. Some sick people in exchange for weapons. Some sick people in exchange for Nosh's item. It seems that morality no longer has a place in the extremities of the crisis. The next scene introduces us to a character named Amir, a man they initially thought had died. He was clearly handled by the aliens and his head has weird deformities from their horrid experiments. He doesn't seem normal in the interactions, and we catch his horrifying wound or something that has been embedded in his head. A woman named Sarah unlocks him and offers him some food, which he gobbles up in no time. She tells him that in exchange for the food that he's been provided with, she'll need a favour. The covering on his head is removed and we get a clear sight of what the aliens did to him. His cranium is some kind of black, bumpy, moving mass, almost oozing out. Body horror at its best. The narrator says that Amir has been reborn through the pain and experience, and now there is something new and special about him. His precognitive abilities that he acquired can be used to be one step ahead of them. It's another glimmer of hope in the gloomy, depressing circumstances. Part 3. Siege The third and last part of Raka shows the troops preparing for an attack. Sarah is trying to get something out of Amir, and he seems to have somewhat recovered from his half-dead state. The others don't really understand why Sarah is so obsessed with Amir, but the leading lady of the resistance, Jasper, knows the potential of using him effectively. Thanks to the implants in him, Amir can foresee the future, or so they think. Sarah pleads with him to help them in this losing war because he can change the course of the battle with his powers. He doesn't respond, but the more she keeps asking him things, the more the colour of his eyes alter. He foresees the militia successfully taking down one of the alien aircraft. An alien is wounded and the forces pursue him to finish him off, but the alien uses his telekinetic abilities on one of the soldiers, and he turns against the others. He's shot dead and so is the alien. Cut its fucking head off. Jasper orders a soldier to cut off its head and we see Sarah pleading with Amir in the background. She tells him that helping them is not merely a choice for him now, but the only way out. He is clearly the last hope for the survivors. And the movie ends on this note. You could say that the climax leaves you on a hopeful note, but it is a cliffhanger that's up to your own interpretation. Please, tell me what futures you see. A few answers to the open-ended narrative. There is one thing about this movie that makes it interesting and frustrating at the same time, and that is the open-ended narrative that leaves too many unanswered questions. 
The director said in an interview that he was intrigued by the idea of an alien invasion that had ravaged humanity. He was interested in exploring the aftermath of this successful conquest. And that is exactly what he has done here. There have been plenty of instances where after a war, an occupying force has traumatised the inhabitants of a nation or region. It gave immediate inspiration to the director, and the narrative is indeed punishing for the audience who would feel similar to these subjugated people. One of the first things that comes to mind is why the Clum are so determined to exterminate humanity in every form. And in case they simply want to destroy everything, why do they take the trouble of performing gruesome experiments on millions of captives? This makes us think about what the alien invaders are actually looking for. The answer to this might be in the scene where a divine cloud-like figure appears before a soldier whose vehicle got blown away. According to the director, this special vision is the reason why the Clums attacked in the first place. They are a far more superior race of non-physical aliens, almost like a godlike entity. Also, Blomkamp has suggested that the Clums are something like a genetically cloned drone that is not entirely sentient. This means that there is a more intelligent species that we haven't seen in the short film, and they might be the ones who are sending the Clums to take over the world. So is there a method in their absolutely crazy mannerisms? Blomkamp sheds light on this angle and suggests that there is something that the Clums lack, and they arrived on Earth to seek these answers. They are making some permanent changes to Earth, and that's only because their stay has exceeded their expectations. What they are really looking for is a way to communicate with the higher species. This adds more juice to the godlike theory because the Clums have been forsaken by this higher alien race, and humans can somehow connect to it. That does explain the shocking body horror and the fascination of the Clums as they experiment with human bodies tearing them apart. They simply want to find out what is in humans that makes them worthy of attention when the angels have clearly turned their back on the Clums or whoever sent them. The supreme race could be way ahead in the storyline and they could help the humans overcome their misery. They wouldn't, however, do it themselves because they are far too evolved for such juvenile fights. They would merely be the tool that humans use to fight their oppressors. And Amir might be a key element in all of this. We would be disappointed if the character of Nosh doesn't have a meaty role in the future development of this story. He certainly caught our attention with his nihilistic mindset and his tactically sharp thinking. One thing is clear in this short film, and that is the prowess of Bloomcamp as a visionary helmer. You cannot help but wonder what he would have done with the Alien franchise that deteriorated faster than the environment. The good news here is that the director has clearly expressed his wish to continue with the plot, and audiences are welcome to pitch in with their ideas of what lies ahead. Do let us know in the comments section what you think could be the next step in the story. Don't do it, Martinez! Don't do it! Our take on the movie. The first thing that came to mind when we watched Raka was its terrific production value. It's a genuinely innovative concept and not some Hollywood mashup of everything you've seen in the last few decades. The narrative will have your interest within the first 30 seconds, and honestly, we haven't watched a better story delivered in 22 minutes. The fantasy visuals will give you goosebumps, and they are done in trademark Blomkamp style. Maybe this short is meant to serve as a demonstration of Blomkamp's cinematic talent, and in that case, the plan certainly worked. The digital effects are very impressive, and we aren't talking from a short film perspective. They are brilliant even for a proper big budget movie, and having the likes of seasoned creature effects supervisors like Alec Gillis helping out surely made things better. Effects artist Alex Lombardi managed to develop a fluid simulation in Houdini that makes the moving black things in Amir's head so realistic. As for the cast, Sigourney Weaver in the lead role is the one to watch out for. The fire. The fire. What is it with you? The fucking fire. The part was originally written for a man, just like it was done for Weaver's role of Ripley in the Alien franchise. Others do justice to their respective characters, but it's the effects that will blow your mind. The aliens are made to look absolutely threatening, and they are vicious and merciless with their actions. The climax makes us anxious for what happens next. It's all the more reason to hope that they come out with the next part, or make a full-length adaptation of this brilliant mindbender. Of course, there are a few downsides as well. The narrative leaves way too many questions unanswered, and the mystery of the angelic vision is one of the most talked about loose threads. Now, you clearly cannot blame a short film for not giving you every single answer, but since it seems no less than a thrilling sci-fi drama, we were disappointed with the unfinished ending. 
Another thing caught our mind is how the enemies are vulnerable to regular bullets and explosives. We couldn't help but wonder how they ended up defeating the major superpowers of the world in the first place, given the amount of advanced weapons and firepower they had. I mean, if rogue surviving militia can shoot down alien aircraft with regular guns, we wonder what the missiles could have done. However, these aren't really flaws, just our thoughts. Raka took our breath away in every sense of the term, and we became even bigger fans of Neil Blomkamp after watching this. If you haven't seen this gem, do check it out. It's available on YouTube and Stremio, and if you appreciate the content, you can always make valuable donations that will help with the funds that can be used to further the storyline in the future. Depending on the response of the audiences, which has been overwhelming so far, the story could be explored further, and wouldn't that be a treat? If you guys enjoyed this video, give us a like, subscribe, and press that bell icon that will help you get notifications. We upload an awesome video every day! Have an amazing day ahead and stay safe!